Now we're going to talk about how the heart functions. In particular, we're going to focus on the chambers and the valves of the heart. And this continues our discussion of the circulatory system, which will continue in subsequent lectures as well. Early on, I emphasized the importance of the circulatory system for providing bulk transport of nutrients to the body. And let's just cover the basics. Where does the blood flow in the body? So we see it in this funny cartoon here. Here's the heart. You can see it as a major vessel that delivers blood to the lungs. That's where gas exchange occurs. And then the blood returns to uh, the heart. The heart is partitioned into left and right sides. So the blood that enters into the right side of the heart uh, does not flow through towards the left side, at least not until the blood passes through the lungs and then returns to the heart. Then it leaves the left heart and flows to the rest of the body. So. If we follow a little parcel of blood, it looks something like this. We have the lungs up top. They become oxygenated. That blood then travels to the cells through the heart and then returns in a deoxygenated state back to the right heart where it is then returned to the lungs. The question for this mini lecture is how does the heart pump? Seems like a basic question, but when you think about it for a moment, it actually gets kind of non-intuitive. Cardiac muscle is just like skeletal muscle capable only of generating tension it can only contract how do you have something that only generates tension in one direction serve to create this unidirectional flow of blood okay the circulatory system is a continuous circuit where the blood only flows one way now to answer this question of how the heart pumps we're gonna take a look at the anatomy real quick. Okay, so I mentioned we have a division between the right and left hearts, or sides of the heart. This is a septum here that provides partition between those two sides of the heart. And we'll get into exactly where the blood flows uh, later on, but just for our current purposes, be aware of the fact that you have these open spaces inside of the heart called chambers. When the muscular walls of the heart contract, the chamber reduces in its volume, and then when the muscles relax, the chamber is passively expand, and then they are actively uh, expanded. All right, so what the, the approach that we're gonna take to addressing this question of how the heart pumps, it's really a mechanical phenomenon, and we're gonna develop an intuition for the mechanics of the heart by considering a simplified model of the heart where we're going to start off with just one chamber and one vessel because okay, this would be a, a major blood vessel that leads from the chamber and this chamber can change its volume by virtue of this piston that we have here so you can think of this as a syringe that's connected to a hose and so we can have these changes in the volume of the chamber. Now, in reality, the chamber um, changes its volume because the walls itself contract. And so we're simplifying that by the motion of this plunger. The first answer that we can provide for how the heart pumps is just that, that the cardiac muscle decreases the chamber diameter. Now let's consider the liquid inside of this system. Okay, this would be modeling the blood flow. And we're gonna add little markers to the blood flow. Just think of them as neutrally buoyant beads that we can uh, use to track where the blood, or in this case, is some abstracted liquid flows. Now, when we push on the plunger, we're simulating the contraction of the muscular walls of the heart. That serves to elevate the pressure inside of the chamber. If you wanted to be quantitative about it, you could calculate that pressure really well because it's just the force that you push on the plunger divided by the cross-sectional area of that plunger. That's gonna be the pressure that the surface of the plunger exerts on this liquid, this incompressible liquid, 
that high pressure on one side of this volume of liquid is going to be greater than the not so compressed volume of liquid that's in the vessel. So as a consequence, in the chamber, we have high pressure as we push on that plunger compared to the vessel. So the chamber volume we see on the left decrease elevates the pressure inside of the chamber. The reason why the blood flows from the chamber to the vessel is because of a pressure gradient, a spatial difference in pressure. And the blood flows upwards on our schematic as we push on the plunger due to that pressure difference. So fluid moves towards lower pressure. All right, so you can see here we're composing our answer to this question in multiple parts. And this is a lot of it that we have the fluid moving towards lower pressure. All right, obviously our model is not very realistic. The heart doesn't look like this. In part uh, because the heart has valves. What do valves do? Well, just a moment ago, let me bounce back for a second. Um, sorry for the repeat. But what we saw here was that the blood would flow away from that high pressure generated by the plunger like this. Now watch what happens as we pull on the plunger. Now the heart doesn't have pulling muscles, but um, it does expand when it relaxes, okay? The elasticity of the heart, that's all the connective tissue that surrounds the contractile cells, will rebound, it'll recoil when the muscles relax. That's in part how we get an expansion in the chamber volume. Now, if our model were an accurate representation of the heart, then it would predict that the blood flows from the heart when it's contracting and then back into the heart. That is, you would have oscillatory flow. And, um, and here, the reason why the liquid moves back into the chamber is because as that piston is pulled on, it's actually creating a low pressure and the liquid will move towards low pressure. We've already established that's what liquids do. And so that just refills the chamber and we've had no net movement of blood flow. And some animals function this way. They propel their blood in one direction and then they return, they reverse direction and they pull the, bl the blood back uh, from the direction that it came. So that is not unidirectional flow, but it's bidirectional flow. If you're a small animal, you might be able to get away with that kind of circulatory system. We, on the other hand, have a unidirectional flow in our circulatory system, which is a more efficient way of operating. And our large bodies, we're pretty large animals, seem to require that unidirectional flow. So how do we get unidirectional flow? How do we elaborate this model to achieve that? Well, the valves provide one essential ingredient. So let's consider how valves work. So we've added a valve here it's shown schematically like a door on a hinge that has a little stop. And when we elevate the pressure by pushing on our plunger, we can see, we get the high pressure, that the valve will swing open towards the low pressure. So this can only occur in one direction because of that stop that we have. So when the pressure increases in the chamber, the door or the valve is free to open towards low pressure. And this makes mechanical sense because you could imagine that the vessel side of that door, that surface towards the vessel side, is exposed to lower pressure than the chamber side. And so the door is gonna tend to be drawn towards the low pressure, just like it was a parcel of liquid and it swings open. Okay, so it opens towards low pressure and because of that stop, we only have that occurring in one direction. And this is indeed what happens for the valves in your heart. And so what we see here is a ultrasound video of one of the valves in the heart. And those hands, well, apparent hands that are clasping together, when they clasp together, that's a closure of a valve. 
And so you can see that when it closes, that um, it provides a tight seal and that prevents uh, backflow uh, so that you only have flow, in this case, going in the rightwards direction and not the other way. Okay, so what we can add to the story is that we have uh, the unidirectional flow that we need, so we only have flowing uh, going upwards, and when we reverse the direction of the piston motion, so we're, start, we're pulling on it, that's going to create low pressure in the chamber that closes the valve and it prevents the backflow as we've noted here on the left. Now this by itself is a problematic model because if we keep pulling on that piston we achieve a tremendous amount of resistance because we're essentially pulling the molecules in a fixed volume, the molecules of the liquid inside of the chamber, and it will therefore rebound and resist that expansion. So you can imagine if you have a syringe, let's just say a syringe without a needle on the end of it, and you put your finger on the end of the syringe and you try to pull on the piston, there'll be an elastic recoil against that as you try to pull on the gas molecules inside of the, of the, um, of the syringe. That's not gonna work. Um, so we have to elaborate this model further to allow for the chamber to refill. And that's what we see here, where now we've got two vessels. One is intended for refilling the chamber, and the other one is going to allow the blood to leave the system and then be carried on to, in the case of the body, and the rest of the body. Let's see how this works. So we've got markers in two colors here. Uh, first, we push on the chamber. Okay, so that's simulating muscular contractions of a heart chamber that elevates the pressure in the chamber that is elevated relative to the vessels that are attached to it. So you have elevated pressure both here and also here. I just haven't labeled it here. But in this vessel, we would expect this door to stay shut because as the low pressure tends to cause it to rotate uh, in that direction, we have that little stop there to prevent it from going anywhere. For the valve on the right-hand side, on the other hand, uh, the stop is arranged on the opposite side, and as a consequence, this valve is, is free to rotate open. And once it's open, then the liquid in the chamber is going to tend to be drawn towards that lower pressure, and we've got our liquid flowing. Now the chamber is going to reverse direction. It's going to expand in its diameter as we pull on that piston. That's going to tend to create um, a relatively low pressure compared to the vessels that are continuous with that chamber. Now that low pressure is going to do two things. It's going to swing the, the valve open while causing the other valve to close. And then the other thing is that it's going to draw the liquid into the chamber because the liquid tends to move towards lower pressure. Now as we increase the pressure in the chamber, we're essentially repeating what we've already seen. That high pressure compared to the vessel is going to tend to open that exit valve and propel the liquid from the system. Now I spent so much time creating this animation, I want to milk it for all it's worth, and we'll play the animation over again. Just watch all the moving parts on this system. And one more time. All right, so we've got the outflow, then we refill it with the darker green particles. Now we elevate the pressure that expels those particles. Okay, so with two valves and one chamber that can change in its volume, we're achieving unidirectional flow, okay? There's gonna be a pause in the movement of liquid, both either entering or exiting when the valve is closed, uh, but still you get net unidirectional movement. There is no backflow. All right, so let's elaborate this model even further. 
and we're going to do that by adding a second chamber to it. It's a smaller chamber, but this chamber is going to assist in the filling up of the main chamber, the larger chamber. So we're going to put it there. And let's see what this um, can do for us. And its ability to help in refilling uh, the larger chamber uh, depends on the timing at which it changes its volume. So let's start by filling up the large chamber. All right, so we've got the small chamber. We're elevating the pressure in that smaller chamber. Okay, I'm referring to this space right here. Because we're pushing on the piston, we're gonna have a pressure elevation. That's gonna cause this valve to open towards lower pressure, and it's gonna allow the liquid to flow into the, the large chamber. Now, the large chamber has filled up, okay? It, it expanded even further uh, because the liquid was moving into the chamber and pushing on the piston. So when this piston pushes, we don't even have to pull on this piston. It will just passively expand in its volume to accommodate the liquid that is moving into the main chamber. Now, when the main chamber has its volume decreased, imagine contraction, of muscles, um, we'll get a reversal of the valves and the liquid leaving the main chamber. So let's just see how that all works again. We've got the smaller um, chamber contracting, increasing pressure, then we expel the blood from the main chamber. Okay, note that the valves are completely passive in all of this. They're mechanically important uh, they have the backstop to protect, uh, prevent the backflow, uh, but they're driven entirely by the pressures that are generated through volumetric changes in the chambers. Okay, let's see how our mechanical model relates to the anatomy of the heart. This may look like quite an elaborate contraption, uh, but when you consider the actual anatomy, you've got the same parts and they work in a very similar way. So here's the heart. Now I mentioned we've got both left and right sides of the heart. Essentially, this mechanical model can be applied to either the left or the right sides. And as we talk about heart mechanics and the activation of the muscles of the heart, I'm gonna focus on just one side of the heart and you can just imagine that the other side of the heart will do something very, very similar. So let's just focus on the right heart to see the parts of the anatomy that correspond to our physical model. First of all, the large chamber in the heart is called a ventricle. All right. The chamber that helps fill the ventricle is called the atrium. Okay. Both the ventricle and the atrium have muscularized walls that allow for a decrease in chamber diameter, much like pushing on the piston of either of these two chambers. Then we have a major vessel for the outflow of the blood. Now the term of that major vessel is different between the left and right hand side. So in the case of the right heart, blood is going to flow to the lungs and whenever blood flows away from the heart in a vessel, you call that vessel an artery. So this is the pulmonary artery. And then I'll explain the other one in a minute uh, for the left heart. Then we have the valves. Now there are different terms for the valves on the left and the right uh, hand side. We're just going to keep it simple by using the same term. This is a general term. It's, it's, it's an accurate uh, description. It's just that we're not gonna get into the names of the particular valves on the left and the right sides. Now the valve that is between the, atria, the atrium and the ventricles is known as the atroventricular valve. Shouldn't be hard to remember because it's between the atrium and the ventricle. The other valve gets its name from its shape. It has three little sort of flaps uh, that have a crescent shape. And so that valve is known as the semilunar valve. So the semilunar valve is the valve that the blood flows through when it goes from the, the ventricle out 
uh, through this major vessel. So in the case of the right heart, it's going from the ventricle through the semilunar valve up to the pulmonary artery where the blood can go either to the uh, right heart or the left heart. Now for the, um, the left heart, which I'm now revealing here, we have the same basic parts. So you've got an AV valve and then the semilunar valve is a little bit hard to see. It's a little um, obstructed there, but it's behind um, the, the right ventricle. And then the blood flows from the left ventricle up into this large vessel, which is called the aorta. Okay, just imagine the blood flowing uh, behind the pulmonary artery uh, through the aorta, where it then branches off and reaches the rest of the body. Okay, so that concludes our answer to this question of how does the heart pump? We have the chambers decreasing in diameter because the cardiac muscle contracts. The chamber volume elevates the pressure. Fluid moves towards low pressure. The valves also move towards low pressure. Those valves prevent backflow with their little backstops uh, here. Now, a real valve does it in a more mechanically sophisticated way, but functionally it's something like that. And the atria function to help fill the ventricles.